What I want to know is out of all the stories you told me, which ones were true and which ones weren't? My dear doctor, they're all true. Even the zombie takeout? Especially the zombie takeout. And welcome to episode 415 of Zombie Takeout, the B-Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And I just got to play Garrick. <laughs> that was so much fun. <laughs> oh, man. That actor, I, I always remembered him like it was a Twilight Zone episode where he played JFK. Mm-hmm. And the deal was, like, somebody stopped the Kennedy assassination. And that was, like, the whole thing was this guy traveling back in time to stop it Hmm. but the the big twist in the end is of course everything got fucked up like a nuclear war was starting and like everything was going crazy i need to look for him in other things because i only know him as garrick um and i adore garrick um anyway before we get to this week's movie um i've recently been watching movies on the weekends which you know when you watch them every week for the show tends not to be a thing (laughs) You know? Yeah. Um, so a couple weekends ago, I saw um, uh, Mortal Engines, which I I do recommend if you can turn your brain off. It's very predictable, but it's a lot of fun. Um, it involves like the major cities of the world being put on wheels and like going to war with each other. Oh wow! Very fun. Uh, again, very predictable. Turn your brain off. Last weekend, I watched Jurassic World, and I need to explain this because it's a Jurassic All right. movie. Here, wait, here's my question up front. Why? Why? <laughs> well, I realized while watching the Mandalorian behind the scenes series, and if you like the Mandalorian, I highly recommend the behind the scenes series. Of um, course. I, re- I realized while watching that, or I while watching that, I developed a bit of a thing for Brace Dallas Howard. Um, and I found out that she's the female lead in the Jurassic World movies, so I decided to watch the first one. Oh, now I can. Now it makes sense. Um, and for the most part, it is what you think it is. Um, it's it's kind of like a Siffy movie with a much larger budget and a little bit less intentional ridiculousness. And it's not that bad if, if you take it on those terms. Um, basic plot line, um, she plays one of the executives at the park. He plays Dinosaur Dundee. <laughs> her nephews come to visit. She pawns them off on her assistant. They slip away from the assistant, end up in lost in the middle of the park when a giant, very dangerous hybrid dinosaur gets loose. They have to go in and rescue him. That's the first half, and then the second half, they're trying to kill the dinosaur. Um, but in the midst of the first half, she has to rescue him from a pterodactyl that's attacking him by grabbing his gun and shooting it. We're not going to bother getting into how she managed to shoot the pterodactyl and not him when she's never fired a gun before. (laughs) But afterwards, he takes his gun back kind of aggressively and then abruptly kisses her. And it is this, like, obvious closed mouth kiss. (laughs) There is no hint of any attraction before this. No lingering glances, no touches that kind of went on longer than they thought they would. Nothing. Like, they're just getting along because they know they have to to survive. What so they it's call completely, a, yeah, so it's completely, a German yeah. kiss where they, they kiss with clenched teeth. Yeah. And it yeah. is com- so it's completely out of nowhere, completely uncomfortable. It felt like watching a sexual assault. <laughs> and then the only other references to this obnoxiously crowbarred in romantic subplot are... A little bit after that, when they first, you know, go to trap the dinosaur after they've rescued the teenage nephews, and the nephews are with them, she doesn't even, like, leave them in the relatively safe, you know, park control room that they keep cutting back to. She takes them with them, you know, she, her, and the nephew should have been in there. Um, She takes them with them, with her when they go to trap the dinosaur. And one of the kids says, you know, your boyfriend is a badass. She just kind of smiles and blushes. And I forget the context, but at the end, he says, I guess we have to stay together. That is the full extent of the romantic subplot. And you don't like a romantic subplot. 
I rarely do. They have in the to first be good. place. I mean, my 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 novel. There's a big romance at the core of it. Um, but and they can be done well, but but, but often I don't they like are when, crowbarred in. I don't like when they're crowbarred in. Um, and often they are. And this was obnoxiously crowbarred. Aside from that, I would almost recommend the movie if you know what you're going in for. It's fun. But that part just ruined it. I, anyway. mean, I would say there, there are many moments I've been angry in movie theaters. Mm-hmm. I would say Jura- the original Jurassic Park is definitely in my top three. <laughs> I don't mind the original. I mean, it's been a long time since I've seen it, but it, it, was, it was idiotic. But it was okay. The effects were good. You know, if you go in just looking for th- cool effects, it's fine. Well, right. That's what sort of goes on about the effects. You know, oh, can you believe they did that? But it was just... The movie itself it's was idiotic. horrendous. Yeah. I, I mean, they actually advertised Jurassic Park merchandise in the damn movie. <laughs> so it was yeah. just, I mean, and the, yeah, and there were just so many unrealistic things about right. it, too. So what's the point of having the effects of creating a dinosaur if you're suspending the laws of physics right. and actually, actually not having a dinosaur dinosaur? Right. Actual raptors were about the size of a turkey. <laughs> but, yeah, um, actually, there was one amusing moment in Jurassic World. Um, one of the techs in the control room was wearing a Jurassic Park t-shirt. Yeah. They kind of called it out. It was amusing. I anyway. Mel Brooks yelling, merchandising. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've watched the movie... Um, I've watched some movies also uh, okay. during our breaks. Uh, one of them was Knives Out, uh, mm. which uh, if you like the murder mystery thing, okay. that that's a brilliant one. Mm. And um, oh, what's his name? The James Bond. <laughs> As you can tell, we did not plan to talk about this stuff. No, no. <laughs> James Bond was uh, really good in that. It kind of like doing a Michael Scott Southern gentleman. There's been which a Bond? murder here current kind of thing. Daniel the current Craig, one. Current Bond Daniel or... Craig. Yeah, okay. that's a and uh, the other movie I've seen, and uh, that's kind of closer to our wheelhouse, uh, The Lighthouse. Oh, I read the plot summary and was thoroughly disturbed, so I don't know if I want to re- review that. I, one. yeah, I, it's, you know what, let's not do it while we're quarantined still. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That. It was a really dumb movie for me to watch in the current situation uh-huh. that we're in, because we are pretty much in the lighthouse yeah. right now. At least I am. <laughs> and without any further ado, on to this week's movie, which is from 2018, What We Left Behind, looking back at Star Wars Deep Space Nine, concluding our <coughs> Joel... Star, hmm? Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Did I say Star Wars? Yes, you did. I apologize. <laughs> Star Trek Deep Space Nine, concluding our July documentary two-parter. I actually thought of another documentary we need to review, but it's already left my brain. Um, I'll have to think of it later. Was it a Star Wars one? No. That okay. was a weird Freudian thing. Um, which is weird I was because... I going to say, there was that one about the Elstree uh, Studios that was no, pretty cool. It wasn't Star Wars related. Anyway, with that, of course, that brings us to the impromptu poster break. Sponsored by Garrick's Clothiers, where you can get a fine custom suit tailored while you wait, and while you're waiting, feel free to talk about all of the classified Federation secrets that you want. We certainly won't be listening. And also brought to you by Love Interests. Anyone can be one, except Mark Alamo. <laughs> oh, poor guy. <laughs> all right, so we have a um, the heir apparent to Star Trek The Next Generation uh, everyone's going to love it. They're going to do something <laughs> different with it, though. Uh, but everyone's just going to love it because it's Star Trek. And Star Trek fans just love anything that's put out right away in the franchise. Yeah. I'm kidding, of course. Uh, they hate it. <laughs> what this documentary really hit home for me, every track is new track. Well, exactly. Uh all of those letters, and, and this documentary does spend an awfully long time reading hate mail, which is hilarious. Every cast member reads at least mm-hmm. one piece of hate mail throughout this documentary. Every major cast member. Uh, even, like, minor ones, like Nog and, like... Well, Nog got kind of big. I mean, like, That's minor, true. like, Keiko. Uh, not Keiko. Um, um, Molly. She had, like, one line toward the end. Right. But anyway, they... Um, so, all of those letters 
you mm-hmm. could easily have said they're the same things that they're talking about Discovery. Yeah. They're talking the Picard, same things yeah. they're talking about Picard. And then the uh, um, Abrams movies and Voyager and Enterprise and yeah. I feel the Abrams movies kind of get a different kind of criticism because they're they're very you know action mainstream kind of thing. Well, but they say that's not Trek because that's true. People said, you know, uh, TNG wasn't Trek because it was intellectual and calm and slow, and it wasn't the action fest that TOS was. And that became the blueprint for Trek. So now when it's not intellectual, and now when you have something that's really action-y that goes back to the originals, people say it's not Trek. That's true. So, uh, right, they, um, they, they really go over how much people hated this uh, series. But really, it was just ahead of its time in the yeah. end. Um, in a lot of ways. They, they talk about... I mean, they're definitely not the first to do a serialized uh, a TV show, because uh, mm-hmm. that was one of the things. However, they were syndicated yeah. and did a, a serialized television show, which was really dangerous, because... They existed in multiple time slots. You never knew when it was on and when right. it wasn't. Um, it, but towards the end, it, you know, it was right. Regu- it was pretty regularly scheduled. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, so they have that. They also daringly cast a, a black man as the captain, mm-hmm. which commander to be pedantic. But... Well, he does become well, a cam- captain yeah. eventually, though. Yeah, they make him a captain again. Um, yeah. Uh, at the start, he's a commander. Season. Yeah, yeah. At the start, he's down to a commander, um, which really is just at, the difference between a station and a ship. It's technically a lower rank, but not really in this case. So, of course, there's people angry about that, and right. there's too many women, mm-hmm. and you know, <laughs> so it's all the same things. People get mad about stuff yeah. to this very day. It's really sad how little we've moved on. Yeah. In over thirty years now is is what this documentary really <laughs> shows more than anything else. We are still in the same exact spot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thirty three. Say which, that again. You cut oh, out a second. Um, I said that we are in the same exact exact spot that we were back in ninety three. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, but then let it roll off them. Of course, they <laughs> they, they could capitulate and it's a lot of the same debate that we saw in last week's documentary of whether they're going to try to win the crowd over right. or whether they're going to go for what they want to go for and really they, they actually run down a checklist that they of things they successfully went for and one they kind of uh you know I love they came that close so but, much but... they're talking about all of these social <laughs> issues that they were ahead of the curve on and they get to LGBT, LGBT, LGBTQ LGBTQ plus representation. And yeah, there was a little bit, but then um, Ira Stephen Bear, the, the showrunner, calls out his own show saying we didn't do enough. Yeah. Fucking and loved I don't know. that. And really, he wouldn't have gotten away with more than he did. No. I mean, the, the way, what he got away with was was pretty cool as it was, but and yeah, he didn't even try is what he kicked himself for. Right. He didn't even, he never asked. Right. And and I don't know. It would have been very disruptive, I think, if Garrick. Just um, came out, yeah. I had no idea came... Garrick was gay. I'd never put that together. I hadn't either until I saw this. Yeah, that was like a what? Of course, yeah. Yeah, it makes I, perfect sense in hindsight. I mean, really, the, 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 the homoerotic thing was more Miles and uh, Bashir <laughs> than it was Garrick. Right. Garrick was more unrequited, of course, but, you know, mm-hmm. Miles and Bashir was always kind of like, dude, just get a room. And then they literally <laughs> do you get, you know, rent hollow suites and uh-huh. play around together in there, but, you know, the thing actually happens. Uh-huh. But, yeah, I didn't realize the sexual tension. And once you they, you see it, you can't unsee oh, yeah. it. You're like, holy shit. Yeah, he is just like... <laughs> and I already loved Garrick. That just helps. It just adds to it for me. Uh, so, where was I? We, um... So, they, they let it roll off the, the, mm-hmm. the criticism. And they pretty much go for what they want to go for. Um, and really, some of the cast, you could tell, just 
absolute family, like all the Ferengi, right. you know, having this tradition mm-hmm. of inviting people over to the house on Saturday before or Sunday before uh, before they shoot mm-hmm. to like have dinner together. Yeah, and when just, there's like, a, really... an episode with multiple Ferengi in it. <laughs> so, and, yeah, just the the uh, cast that they they had on deck to. And of course, need I say more than Jeffrey Combs? Jeffrey Combs plays a Vorta. I'm only just starting season three. I cannot wait to get to that. I cannot wait to fucking hate him. <laughs> oh, he's so hateable in this. He is. Because I already hate Vorta. I, I understand the Vorta already because of Clear Skies, the Star Trek RPG I watch. I saw that Combs plays a Vorta. I can't fucking wait. Yeah, he is. Uh, he's quite punchable, and you can't wait for him to. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, he dies multiple times, which is yes. beautiful. <laughs> yes. Uh, and um, they need to bring him into like the newer Trek mm-hmm. series. Oh, he's old, I'm sure. Like every, I saw someone online suggest he should be the Doctor in uh, Strange New Worlds. Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah. Like he'd be perfect to play that older doctor, that mm. you know, the original Bones, really. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so if we pretty much have a Star Trek crew and um, very eccentric personalities, and um, I mean, there's some pretty heavy moments too, of course. Mm. Where I mean, the the talk about from the vets, yeah, uh, who Love watched that. the the episode with the uh, is. Um, I keep on just call him Nog <laughs> Eisenberg, who like passed. I'm trying to remember when it was, it was last year. It, yeah, it was 19. I think it was shortly after we saw this in the theater. Okay, like I think we saw it in the summer, mm-hmm. and then Maybe I think it was late 18 right oh. after it. Yeah, this is kind of a half-assed Rene Aubergenois tribute because we couldn't find anything else that we we fed us that he'd done. Right, he really wasn't a movie actor, yeah. and uh, yeah, so it just the the inner workings of this TV series. It's very honest. I love that they they left in all the disagreements, and they had a really clever device where they were talking about a, an imagined season eight. The writers were yeah. breaking season eight, or the first episode of it. So you got to see how a writer's room would work in a sci-fi show. So mm. it was just, I mean, there's and just so And I wish so I could see that things. opening episode of season, season 8 now. Of course. <laughs> I loved Eisenberg's uh, mm-hmm. walk-off after yeah. they found out they were going to kill him. <laughs> yeah. Hilarity ensues. Hilarity ensues. And I have to admit, I was going to say this before. In recent years, I've actually become more of a Star Trek fan than a Star Wars fan. Because, I mean, I loved Star Wars as a kid, kind of lost interest in it after Jedi, got more into Star Wars between, like, 85 and 95, or Trek, rather, between 85 and 95. Then in the mid-90s, I got back into Star Wars kind of hardcore. Recent years, thanks to the two RPGs I've watched, uh, Clear Skies and Shield of Tomorrow, and a bit Flood of the Void, they're doing a Klingon one now, um, and the new series and the movies, I've really kind of fallen in love with track. Um, I, hmm? I, I mean, I saw it when I was like four. So, so say that you're I, I started as a star Wars fan. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, say that, say that again. Okay. I was always, um, a star Wars fan. Well, I started as a star Wars fan because I saw the movie when I was like four years old <laughs> and the show always seemed boring to me when I was little, but right. you know, in teenage years, you know, I didn't leave star Wars behind, but could easily see how star Trek and doctor who pretty much at the same time, uh, were, were just awesome. Things yeah, I didn't get into who until to news escape was. to, um, but yeah, um, I don't oh, know. Well, I loved TOS before TNG aired, so I was one of the people who hated TNG when it started because it was different. Um, but I do have a question. It, it was cool to. It was cool because it was just like, oh my god, we've got new Star Trek. Because I mean, there were so many dated, hippy mm-hmm. dippy Star Trek episodes that you're kind of like, oh, okay, <laughs> where they're screaming Herbert at him and stuff. Mm-hmm. That one. <laughs> 
I do have a question, yeah, question. though, and but though this was kind of addressed in the documentary. Did Bashir remain an insufferable douchebag for the entire series, or did he become more tolerable at some point, preferably after getting the shit beaten out of him one, like five or six times on camera? <laughs> I, I think he became more tolerable. Um, they kind of suggest that, yeah. I fucking hate him. I'm, like I said, just starting season three, I, already, I still fucking hate him. <laughs> yeah, I think he, he you know, worms up, <laughs> you know, he matures as the, the story goes on, as they, they explain. Uh, they uh, did they even get do they get to the plot yet where about his um his makeup or his abilities no no um the okay. war just started <laughs> okay uh, um i actually was gonna message you that question like three or four weeks ago when i was watching season one um but i realized we're reviewing the documentary soon so i'll, I'll hold on to it <laughs> well that was the fun of this cast was that not everyone got along mm-hmm. and he's you know, because he's he's the, you know, the doctor who's looking for adventure, at, and you know wants to go out to this space station to like you know get into the action, right. not knowing what the action is. Yeah. Now the movie opens up with the actor who played Rom doing this lounge song about <laughs> DS Nine. Now I'm so glad I... I'd seen him out of makeup and knew who it was. <laughs> One thing I've hated about Deep Space Nine is the lounge lizard stuff. I haven't gotten to that yet. I'm not looking forward to it. Ah, uh, uh, why? But that opening was just painful. I, I have make it stop as one of my notes. <laughs> And then we hear a voiceover from, I think it's Mark Robinson, um, Garrick. I recognized his voice before I recognized him out of makeup. Now, the lounge lizard stuff was annoying, with the exception of Jeffrey Combs. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, I liked the ending. The lounge lizard thing oh, at that's the right. end, I dug. Combs didn't come until the end, that's right, yeah. that's right. That I enjoyed, they but the, first, the beginning Combs. one was just painful. Um, like I said, I love them reading the negative reviews. Um, Iris Stephen Baird's Bear's blue goatee kind of makes me wonder if I'm missing an opportunity. Because <laughs> I started losing my hair in my early 20s. And, you know, so, but I've had a beard off and on here and there. I never thought about dyeing my beard. Kind of always wished I would have dyed my hair, but, you know, receding dyed hair just looks tragic. <laughs> Speaking of how the cast and crew look now, Nana Visitor has aged incredibly well. Yes. I was shocked. She, I, aside I from say, her hair going gray, she barely looks older. I'd say all of the women have aged well, them, mm. actually. But particularly her, though. Um, it just caught, my, it caught me off guard. Um and they, they talk about how DS9 isn't thought of as well uh, as well as you know TOS or TNG, but Voyager was really the one that got the shit. I've not even made it through Voyager, honestly. It's the only Star Trek I've not. And Voyager made it was through. the one I loved. I watched religiously. <laughs> um, so I remember all the shit that one got. I mean, until Discovery, obviously, Discovery got piled on more than Voyager did because it was very action heavy. Now, I, I mean. For Deep Space Nine, I, they kind of lost me somewhere in the first or second se- season, mm-hmm. and then I wound up picking it back up. Maybe I think in the third. See, I think, I've yeah, watched like, think... most of the first two seasons. Bail- bailed for some reason. Um, I don't remember why. I think that's when I got into Ch- Star-, Star Wars and, and kind of thought I had to. Um, but you were talking about on Messenger about how this was going to spoil so much for me. It really yeah. didn't spoil much, because a lot of it I already knew. I already knew about Worf. I already knew about Ezri. Um, there were a few other things, but there were only a few things that it kind of spoiled for me, and none of it I really cared about. Like, Odo and Kira getting together. I didn't know that was going to happen. Um, yeah. I didn't know that apparently uh, Cisco is going to ascend at the end. Yes. I didn't know about that. Um, Which, I mean, if you think about it, they set that up in the pilot. Oh yeah, it's like set up they, real. Yeah. They totally. It's yeah. not like added. Like what? This is weird. Out of nowhere. They pretty yeah. much tell you that's what's going to happen in the pilot. But of course, you kind of forget about that. 
until the end. You're like, oh, wait a minute. But I think the real problem for DS9 is that it premiered a year before Babylon 5. And that they really were compared a lot. Yeah. Because they're both set on space stations. And, and yeah, Babylon 5 was just beloved. Yeah. I never really got into it. Bab- Babylon 5, I love Babylon 5 from the second season on. The first season is a slog. Like, you have to get through it to understand some stuff, but it is painful. <laughs> from season two on, it's a masterpiece. You'd say it's more of a slog than season one of DS9? Oh, absolutely. I didn't mind season one of DS9. <laughs> oh, I wow, mean, it so, wasn't yeah. great, but it was fine. It's probably the best first season of a lot of Star of a lot of Star Trek. Um, and I also didn't think about it. I don't think about it being particularly dark now. But you know, when they were explaining that it's probably the darkest Star Trek series, it, it really is. Oh yeah, because it's not well, about yeah the because hope. before this, mm-hmm. before this, it was all about a utopian right. You know. And, you know, somewhere someone said, you really can't have a drama set in a utopia. Right. Something they (laughs) didn't realize again until Picard. (laughs) Yeah. And people... The series wasn't really a utopia, so... There wasn't really a drama, so... Mm -hmm. Action can work in a utopia. Right. Yeah, we do all this and get away with it. Right. Um... And people complain about, you know, the Federation being compromised in, in Picard. DS9 played with that, too. Oh, yeah. In fact, uh, you know, this is where that uh, Section 31 right. w- w- came up. Did Section thir- was Section 31 invented for in DS9? I, yeah, yeah. Okay. Surprised it took them that long to realize that the Federation would have, an, uh, you know, a, a shady intelligence aspect. Right, so when they bring this back in in um, Discovery, you know, it's kind of like, oh, this is cool because you know, the, the yeah, the episodes with Bashir being recruited and stuff are were, were just really good. Nice. Now, one thing that kind of bugged me were the ads. I watched this on Amazon. I don't see ads much anymore. So seeing ads suddenly crowbarred into the middle of this movie kind of get on my nerves. I, you know, it might. Mine didn't have ads. You watched it on Amazon? Yeah. You must have a must have a much better ad blocker than I do. We'll have to discuss that later. <laughs> it was nice to see how Kira and Dax uh influenced a lot of women. Yeah. Yeah, I had Oh yeah, totally. And just I, I you know how rev- revolutionary representation of women was on the show, because you don't think about that twenty five years later. Did we know someone that named their kid Jadzia? Yes, we did. Um, I haven't thought about anything. Yes. Me neither. Um, loved the disagreement about Quark and Rom's heads being switched. Like, um, Iris Stephen Baird remembered it one way, and um, Armin Shimmerman <laughs> and not, uh, Rom, like, I don't know the actor's name offhand, I apologize, um, did not remember this happening. <laughs> And they I, left I need a doubt lot. that it really happened. Yeah. And they left a lot of that stuff in where they like disagreed over stories and you'd hear someone listening to a story and just rolling their eyes. <laughs> love that they left all that in. Um, love the story of um, Rene Aubergenois tearing his makeup off at the end of the season six and <laughs> handing it to Iris Stephen Bear. <laughs> and he goes and frames it. Yeah, and he and has it framed it, in his home to this day. It's sitting in his living room. Like, I'm done with this shit. Goodbye. Here's the pain you've caused <laughs> me over the years. <laughs> I was a bit shocked that Marco Limo felt underappreciated because Ducat was iconic on that show. Uh, right. And he had to have been good because he was a pain in the ass, obviously. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, he had to have been good for them to want to put up with him mm-hmm. to bring him back. And and just the character. I mean, maybe it's watching it now that he seems so iconic. Maybe he wasn't seen as so iconic in the time. But they kind of suggest he was because he was a lot more popular than Garrick. Right. They said, that, that was shocking to me when they said that he was 
the popular Cardassian mm-hmm. and uh you know, not Garrick. It was kind of like not Garrick. Who who doesn't like Garrick? Yeah. <laughs> also surprised that opening season two with a three parter was so revolutionary, but I forget how episodic everything was back then. Right, because I thought I remember Next Generation having unofficial three parters, episodes mm-hmm. that kind of went together. Uh, right. Like, like I think there was one with like the Klingon Civil War and stuff where they just, you know, <laughs> and that came before this. But I think serialized TV didn't really become a thing until the late 90s. Well, Botchko was doing it for yeah. a long time True. in different degrees. Mm-hmm. Um and and I know like the show Wise Guy would do like a whole right. season story, and I think yeah, Crime Story also. You know, Michael Mann was doing that. But those were all cop shows in the genre, as it's called. You didn't. You had a lot of monster of the week. That's where the term monster of the week comes from. Well, the big difference is isn't that they were cop shows. It's that they were network shows, oh. and they had a nice, steady time slot. Right, advertised. You knew where it was and knew how to see it. Uh-huh. We're, we're Deep Space Nine. I think we got back into it because it was something that was on when we got home from wherever, you know, on like a Sunday night. Uh-huh. That was kind of the official end of the week. Was like, oh yeah, DS 9s on. You know. Uh-huh. I remember um, when Buffy went serialized in season two, because season one was pure Monster of the Week, there was a lot of controversy about it because it was such a change and, you know, people weren't ready for a serialized show in the genre. Um, You know, serialized horror instead of this simplistic Monster of the Week thing. And watching season one and two, I'm realizing just how over-episodic TV I am. Yeah. I mean, it, it feels episodic, too episodic to me. No, I didn't realize how even serialized it was for its time. <laughs> yeah, so for a syndicated show, yeah, that was a big deal. Yeah, and it was kind of sad to hear how against ser- serialization the network was. Um, oh, incidentally, the apostrophe in Kronos is after the uh, the first O. <laughs> And it's pronounced Kronos in English because it's transliterated. It's spelled okay. Q-O apostrophe N-O-S. Yeah. Um, and uh, even after 40 minutes, so Cisco's Ascension was the only spoiler. Um, 40 minutes of the documentary, I mean. Um, I love that po- the, they approached it as plot was secondary to character. Yeah. Explains why I'm, I'm you know, love enjoying it so much. Um, oh, and yeah, like I said, Odo Kira was, was a spoiler. Um, didn't realize its take on terrorism was so far ahead of its time. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh. You cut out again. Well, you know, they just were exploring, you know, when you're a soldier and you're just doing what you have to do or whatever, or following orders, mm-hmm. uh, what the repercussions are for that. Yeah. Um. Oh. And, um... I well, I am not looking forward. To, I'm just going through my notes. I'm not looking forward to the musical stuff. <laughs> I mean, I appreciate that they went there, but eh. it's uh yeah, and I think they, I don't know. I was annoyed by them. <laughs> um, now, Bill Mooney was in this documentary. Will Robinson, the original Will Robinson. Oh yeah. Because apparently he was a guest star on DS9. He was also a regular on Babylon 5. Really? Mm-hmm. He was, like, one of the Mimbari. Um, but that I that I, I enjoyed because, you know, like I said, those two shows were compared a lot because they were both on space stations, both airing at the same time. Um, love that Combs got mentioned three times in the list of recurring players. They get to Jeffrey Combs and they say his name, like, three times. Apparently there was a connection issue. Uh, you there? Yeah, he, uh, there was yeah, a yeah, connection okay. problem. You went... Hello. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the last thing you said was Jeffrey Combs. Yeah, he. I love how they got men. How he got mentioned like three times in in the list of recurring players. <laughs> they like said repeated his name three times. That would explain why you you've been cutting out here and there. Okay, I'm just leaving this all in, because so, now we have an explanation. Um, 
Uh, the stunt coordinator I loved. He looked like a reject from a hair metal band. <laughs> yes. I thought, like, wait, do they have somebody from Journey on this? He even had a bandana <laughs> around his calf. I never understood that. I lived through the 80s. I was a hair metal fan. I never understood the bandana around the leg. Uh, it it was cool the just the variety of people they had at least give something in this, you know. Mm-hmm, yeah. And I love how in depth they went out about on on about uh Terry Farrell's decision to leave. Well, yeah, that was that that's the elephant in the room, of course. Mm-hmm. And I think you could piece together just from <laughs> what was said and unsaid here, yeah. you know, that she gave a pretty detailed account of what happened mm-hmm. and the stu- and the uh, producers of course were very like I don't know <laughs> yeah. so it's kind of like wait a minute <laughs> it was you're taking this amount of money or goodbye and she said goodbye yeah, like what he said it was something like um, I we can't say anything different than mm-hmm. the lower producers said by the time you get to me which is kind of like what what's that mean yeah just, I don't know what to do about it. But they right. want to save some money is really what it came down to. Right. Um, I loved the wormhole cosplay that they showed briefly, too. <laughs> the dress that turned into the wormhole. Loved that. And I realized with only seven, seven minutes, 17 minutes left to the, the show, the movie, that the whole planned season eight spiel was just a way to show how they break seasons. Or break yeah. out. I thought they were actually talking about some kind of fantasy season that I would have loved to see. I was a little disappointed <laughs> when I finally realized that's why they were talking about it. But yeah, it was just bringing the room together and it's like, yeah. this is how we would have, uh, you know, and yeah, just throwing things out there and then kind of seeing how they, they become that thing, you yeah. know? Which was fascinating okay. in hindsight. Um, you know, to get okay, a little insight into that. I was driving here and I thought we we're going to kill uh, Miles, <laughs> but then uh, it's got to be Nog. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, during the little retrospective thing at the end, they mentioned John Colicos, the original Balthar from the original Battlestar Galactica. I did not know he was on VS9. Yeah, yeah, I wonder what episode. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing him. Um, I also didn't know Iggy Pop played a Vorta. That's something I'm really looking forward to. Star Trek's always had a rich history of just, you know, who knows what guest star they could cram in there, yeah. you know, in weird outfits and stuff. But Iggy They're from Pop and Jeffrey too. Combs as Vorta. I may have to reassess my opinion of Vorta now. <laughs> Iggy Pop. <laughs> I'm just really glad I watched the closing credits because there was so much to it. You know, we had right. that little lounge singer gag. And then you skim forward a little bit, and Stephen Bear shows. Iris Stephen Bear shows up, and just starts going on a spiel. Nana visitor show, comes in, and they go on. You know, I love that they mention trials and tribulations. Oh, that that is one of the best episodes in any franchise. I think. I am a little annoyed that they didn't say much about Morn, because I adore Morn. <laughs> Does he ever have a line? No, no, I, 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 I was hoping not. <laughs> Never. No, I don't remember. I don't think he did. No, uh, that's brilliant. That he never had a word, but he's such a fixture, and the actor gave him so much personality without saying a fucking word. Uh, sort of George went. <laughs> yeah, effectively, he he is the norm of of quarks. You're right. Right, he's just norm backwards. <laughs> yeah. Oh shit. I I didn't connect that. You're right. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's really what they did. They just wanted a nice little Cheers reference. Oh wow, nice. <laughs> Quarks. And so yeah, it would, I mean, it would have been nice if they had done that. Really, well, I think the shocking thing that they did not mention in this mm-hmm. was that Kira and Bashir married in real life for like a season or two. Yeah, I already knew that. So it, it didn't catch me off guard when they briefly mentioned it. Yeah. Right, right. So it's kind of like, though, I mean, I guess they just want to dig up, like, whatever happened there. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that's pretty fucked up for a show, if you think about it. Yeah. I mean, people hook up on shows all the time, I'm yeah. sure. Well, and how when you're working, you what they said, like, 16 hours a day with each other, things are going to happen. 
how often do they get married? Like, I think they got married between seasons one and two, and I don't know when they got. Yeah, I had a kid, and I think they got divorced like before the show was even done. Mm -hmm. Not surprising. Um, And you know, like I said, the 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 greatest moment in DS Nine history. (laughs) Because I've watched that episode fairly recently. It's a season one episode. And you're just like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it was that was cringy in the in watching in the episode, and then they they reference it there, reference it there, and oh god, I almost fell out of my chair. As the greatest moment yeah. in DS Night history. <laughs> <laughs> on, to, on to brains, because there's no sequels and remakes here. I mean, unless they do that fictional. Of season eight, I just, I just looked it up. They got married in '97 and were divorced in '01. So I guess okay. that was after the season series uh-huh. had finished. Underbrains, underbrains. This is a five. Yeah, you know, it just if you want to look about writing or sci-fi or creating a TV show in general, this okay. this is just a much much C let alone a Star Trek series. And I just love how warts and all it was, leaving in the disagreements about what things had happened and all of the controversies, like with Terry Farrell and everything. Yeah. And they were just so open about it. And the whole bit about season eight was brilliant. And just the weirdness of the musical numbers, which I, now I know fits the show. It's yeah. just brilliant. Uh, the, the other thing that I forgot was them being resentful about bringing Worf in. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. you like, and and of course they made, they're quick to say not Michael Dorn, because I mean, how could you not love Michael Dorn? Mm -hmm. He seems like an awesome guy to hang out with. Um, But just the fact that, you know, they didn't have faith in them on their own. Like their bigger brother had to come in and save them. Yeah. But Mm -hmm. it does make the show so much better. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So what have we learned? Uh, we learned that uh, life's too short to make things just for executives. And now I learned that I really need to binge watch the rest of the series. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just starting season two, three. The war just started. I need to binge the rest of it because I had no idea it got that weird. Because <laughs> you were worried about it spoiling it for me. It really just made me want to push through the series. And I think also you see how crazy cool... Um, <laughs> Cisco. Oh yeah. Well, I knew about that. This. I remembered him yeah. from Hawk. Hell, I remember yeah. him from Spencer for Hire. Well, that was Spencer for Hire. Hawk. No, Hawk was its own show. That was a oh, spinoff of Spencer for Hire. Okay. So you I know, forgot I, that they spun did a spinoff for him. So I understood all the Captain Hawk stuff when it was happening. Um, but yeah, I remember when he shaved his head. I think, like I said, I think I said earlier, I was, must have been checking on the show periodically because I remember the head shaving and the goatee and and Worf and him getting together with Jadzia and Ezri and all of that. Uh, I'm glad I knew about Ezri because I would have been upset if this was the first time I was finding out about that. Yeah. Yeah, because that was, that was quite a gut punch, mm-hmm. that, uh, that episode. I think we knew she was leaving, I right. think. I forget now. Anyway, that's it for What We Left Behind. Until next time, we'll be doing an anime double feature with Pale Cocoon and Padma Inverted, both by director Yasuhiro Yashu- Yoshiura. Uh, we have, you know, it's it's that time of year again. We always do anime in the spring and summer. So we're, I'm getting into a double feature here. The, um, Pale Cocoon's only 20 minutes, so, you know, it's not like we're doing two full movies. Um, Until then, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.